This is Too Many Words. I'm Jamie Benningfield, your host. You are listening to my podcast. I ramble and then I ra- I talk to a guest. And uh, today I have actor, writer, and comedian Kevin Bartini on. Uh, really fun talk, fun guy. And uh, look forward to that because I'll have that for you guys in a bit here. How is everybody doing? How are you? What's going on? What are your troubles? What are your thoughts? I'm still exhausted and that will be my, I mean, that will be my default status for the summer. Summer is exhausting. Kids are exhausting. Today I'm actually recording this on a Friday morning and my kids are at a camp all day and I'm working all day and it's wonderful. Don't get me wrong. I love my kids. They're fantastic little people and um, they add so much to my life, but they're loud and they're very intense ages, almost seven and then eight and a half. And everything is, you know, um, I shouldn't be, you know, I'm not surprised that both of my kids have a smart ass answer to, you know, say every in response to everything because uh, I am a smart ass. My husband, you know, very quippy. So, of course, you know, our kids always, you know, and we're working, you know, it's a thing back and forth, you know, balancing the line of cool parent and dictator. And the summer is especially trying because they're, you know, they're around all the time and they have their bored moments. But it's important to be bored. Boredom is important. That's where you find your interests and learn more about yourself. And I'm always telling you when they say I'm bored. I said, no, you're not. You're just not, you know, there's no flashing screen in front of your face or we're not on some extravagant adventure. You have quiet time. I love quiet time. You should also love quiet time. But uh, yeah, but it's going good. And we're having some fun times. We're doing some exploring. And I'm actually making it work. The first week of summer vacation, I spent every day pretty much hitting my head against the wall. And, you know, I didn't have my new schedule handled at all in the slightest, even close. I We're in a rhythm now. And uh, I'm also learning so much every day um, with all the stuff that I'm doing that I'm actually, you know, I looked at myself yesterday and I was like, oh, wow, you know. If uh, I didn't know any better, it would seem like I have this under control. Uh, but I, um, I'm learning a lot, and I'm applying the things that I'm learning. So at the moment, I'm feeling like I'm starting to get a handle on things. And, you know, I was uh, – there's this – I was on um, – I was on Stumble Upon the other day, stumbling, and I stumbled upon uh, – this uh, article um, featuring Stephen King. And it was basically just the whole article was different advice he was giving to writers as a writer. And the one thing, the one thing that really stood out to me was have fun. And it's, at first glance, it's, you know, it seems like an odd thing to point out because it's like, of course, you're going to have fun. But no, actually. And that's, you know, when I read that and I looked very closely at myself, it's like, you know, I've been so serious and, you know, ultra goal driven that perhaps I'm not having as much fun as I could be. And once I noticed that, I, I really, you know, as I was working on each project and have been working on each project, uh, I've been making a point to enjoy myself and not think about how many words I'm in or how I'm looking for my deadline or how clean it is, especially that first draft. Just get it out. Get it out there. Um, and I've been having more fun and applying more balance. I've I'm doing a better job not working when I'm not working. Um, my mind is present. It makes a big difference. So I'm handling it, guys. How are you doing? Where are you? Are you handling things? My advice is this. Just really listen to yourself. I tend to not listen to myself because I'm telling myself what to do too loudly, which perhaps I should apply that to parenting and, uh, you know. Okay. But, um... Part of why I'm probably having so much fun is because of the uh, Meanwhile in Washington anthology that I'm co-writing with H.M. Jones. It is just a hoot. Um, she's awesome and super fun. Um, she's on, 
I've had three different episodes with her. So go into the iTunes or the Google Play library, wherever you're listening to me, and find the shows with H.M. Jones because they're all gems. Uh, she's a she's a cool person. Uh, I'm happy that uh, we're working on this together. And, uh, yeah, so I've been mainly focusing on my wizard story as I get it. We're, we're swapping stories on Monday. She's giving me the one she's been working on. I'm giving her the one I've been working on, and we're going to each take a look at each other's. And um, the more that we do that, we'll have a clearer idea when the release date is. So stay tuned for that. Um, But it's just super fun. We're having a great time. I am reading two books at the moment. I am reading The Perdition Score by Richard Cadtree. I'm almost done with it, and it's, like all of his books, awesome. A Hundred Thousand Worlds by Bob Prohl, and I will be talking to, I have chat scheduled with both Richard Cadry and Bob Prohl coming up, and uh, I'm excited to chat with both of them. Fantastic um, book and also series, the um, Sandman Slime series, which is the Perdition Score, is the eighth um, book in that series. If you're not reading that series and you like real gritty fantasy, funny, dark and twisted books, um, definitely pick those up because they're some of my favorite but uh and I will I will keep you posted with all those dates and when I actually finish reading them I'll I'll ramble about them a little bit working towards a large goal or working towards finishing a big project juggling multiple projects it's you know it's I love it it's how you know it's how I'm at my best and I love getting into all different things and meeting different people but it's the whole thing, the the thing as a whole, it's a process. And um, starting out, it's very overwhelming. And even if I look, you know, at myself now compared to my, you know, I mean, myself three years ago, it's a uh, world's different. So even though it seems so gradual sometimes or so slow moving, everything that's done is uh, it accumulates and it builds something and learning new things is good. But, you know, being in that process and doing what I do, I love to talk to others who have done it or or are also doing it um, currently because it's, you know, and we all, as humans, we all like community. We all like to hear others um, that feel similarly. And, you know, anytime that I talk to somebody about their journey into, you know, building their career, I always walk away from that conversation learning something. And uh, a lot of what Kevin Bartini and I talk about is just, you know, how he's built what he's built and how awesome technology is and has helped with that. So um, it's uh, it's good stuff, and that's where we're going now. So uh, after these few notes, I'll be talking to you. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey, Jamie. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. I was uh, about a month or so back. I was just, you know, kind of lurking around Twitter, um, not to make myself sound creepy. And I was just looking to see who would be an interesting guest. And I I came across you, which led me to uh, the Unintentionally White album. And I'm like, oh, this guy's funny. I got to bring him on and talk to him. So. Oh, cool. Thank you. I'm glad you listened to it and liked it. Thank you very much. You're a uh, warm up comedian for some uh, different nighttime shows correct yes yeah that's uh for lack of a better term a day job yeah um it's a pretty cool day job (laughs) yeah it's not bad it's not bad it it offers me the chance to uh to you know to work as a comedian and 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 have a lot of free time to explore uh pretty much whatever i want to do i was just able to do a you know i just finished a play and now i'm starting a writing project so it's it's fun. It's a fun job that, that gives me the freedom and the time to do all the other things that I want to do. So I'm, I'm grateful to have it. Nice. It's, it's, it's nice to have those. So you said you just finished writing a play. No, I fin- I just finished performing the play, and, I'll, and now I've moved on to, uh, to a, a project writing for somebody else. But I haven't written a play. Oh, okay. What, what, play were you, I, what play were you in? Oh, uh, the last one I just did was A Midsummer Night's Dream, and then um, I'm, I'm with a theater company here in New York, and we do a, a, a different, it's an off-Broadway company, and this is the third show I've been able to do with them in a year. Oh, how before. cool. Yeah, they're they're a great group of people, and uh, they seem to like me, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Oh, that's really cool. I, I gotta say, I didn't, um, 
that's one thing I didn't find that you were you were doing that. That's the midnight midsummer night's dream. I love that story. Yeah, it's a pretty popular show. That's yeah, Shakespeare goes. It's one of his more accessible works, I'd say. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's a bit more. Uh, I mean, uplifting is the wrong word, but it's it's got a different tone than a lot of his other ones, which have you know the more bit more dire. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's 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 one of his lighter comedies, you know, and and especially. You know, when his his canon includes things like Macbeth, it's yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, Othello is always a you know a bit of a gut yeah. punch as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually looking uh, next. I don't know what we're going to be doing next in the company, but I'm I'm going to be sometime this week planning to read The Merchant of Venice and uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona because I'm going to be seeing them uh, live in about a week or two, and I find that's the best way. To, to go into Shakespeare is to have read the script and be familiar with it because of how daunting the language can be, you know. But if you have some idea of what's going on, it makes it a whole lot easier to understand and comprehend what, what you're watching and enjoy it all the more. Definitely. Well, there was like, I want to say like a solid two years of my life where like I was I was pretty uh, dedicated on just ab- absorbing different Shakespeare works and um, yeah, it was in my moodier phase of life as well. I mean, I think I was like 16. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was very fortunate where I went to high school. Um, I grew up in the Berkshires, which is in western Massachusetts. And it's a very, um, very bucolic area. And it's I mean, just to give you an, an idea where I where I grew up, uh, only maybe two miles from me is where Norman Rockwell's uh, studio was. So all the when you oh, see wow. that Rockwell stuff, that's the Berkshires. That's yeah. where I grew up. We have a lot of summer stock theater up there, which I was very involved with in my younger years. And um, one of the companies, my favorite, is called Shakespeare and Company, and they're out of Lenox. And what they do is, is unlike a lot of the other summer stock companies and theater companies, they don't leave. They're there year round. And um, so during the winter, they or the fall, they send their directors and some of their actors and technicians and such they send them into the various high schools there's about i think probably maybe like 15 high schools in the region that that they work with and so they send their directors into the high schools and they work with the school's drama program and during the fall instead of doing my fair lady or something like that each high school does a shakespeare play and so we learn we learn shakespeare i learned for four years by actual working professional Shakespearean actors and directors and they taught us how to read it and how to understand it and then we would put a play on and we would do it at our school and then after like a two-week run at our school we would do what they called the fall festival which was every school in the region performs at once at uh at a at a theater uh close by and you get to watch the others and interact it's a it's really an amazing program that they do and there's nothing like it in the world so i was looking back and you know being able to really understand it and comprehend it now i was so lucky to have been able to have done that because what a leg up it gave me as far as just confidence on stage once i became a stand-up and uh and in an, an understanding of when i do get acting work you know just the the proper steps to be able to go in and do it. And that's why this day and age, I can go from doing stand up to audience warm up and then acting in Shakespeare. And, and it's all just because of the foundation that they gave me. So I'm, I'm wow. very, very lucky for that. Yeah, no, that's a, that sounds like a fabulous program. They were just nominated this year for a Tony uh, for their, um, for their uh, programs as, as far as their educational programs. Unfortunately, they didn't win, which is a travesty. But uh, I'm sure I'm sure their Tony is, is coming sometime in the next couple of years because what they do is really phenomenal. Well, I mean, any time that, you know, there's that, you know, theater, writing, art infused in, in the school, it just makes such a difference because more than half of the kids, you know, are like not grabbed by all this, you know, academic stuff. And mm-hmm. so many, so many kids are just you're not able to... Uh, you know, explore different talents that they might not even know that they have. So that that's yeah. re- that's really cool. Yeah, I have a, and I, I still maintain a relationship with them, and and you know, I'm 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 such a I'm so much in in their debt. But like, you know, what they say is their 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 goal is really just to plant the seed in 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 people of of not only just of Shakespeare, but of you know the confidence that goes along with being able to do it. And you know, ninety nine percent of the students 
you know, go on and, and never do another bit of theater, but they have, they have those skills that they've learned that then they use in, you know, in the boardroom or in, in other jobs and other facets of, of their work. So I, I, what they do is really invaluable. And like I said, I'm just so lucky to have been able, you know, with, with what my career path was and what I wanted to do to have had that opportunity was just so wonderful. And so I'm so in debt to them. That's awesome. Yeah, um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, when I was, uh, I can still kind of pinpoint, when I was in uh, seventh grade, I took a, my first creative writing class, and um, the teacher was going on about what if and how to kind of, you know, the, the what if question can, you know, spark all different kinds of plot points, and it was like, that was like a moment that I can point back to and be like, yes, like, and I got into it, I've pretty much been writing steadily ever since, and that, so it, it's cool. Yeah, it's great. We're the lucky ones who who found what we wanted to do young and were able to work at it. And, yeah, and that's that's a great thing. Mm-hmm. How did you kind of get started with with doing stand up and and all that? Um, well, I mean, the first thing is, and it goes back to the theater stuff. But I wanted to be a stand up since I was, I say six years old. I bet it was a little younger, but. Um, <laughs> I was I, I was uh, a, a child of the 80s, and that was the comedy boom as far as stand-up and cable television. And uh, my father first turned me on to Saturday Night Live and the original SNL and the original cast, and I loved that. And, and then I started to see stand-ups, and I was just, I was such a, you know, what you would now call a comedy nerd, even as a seven, eight year old kid. <laughs> Um, and I was, and I, but that combined with the fact that I was, I was, my father was very funny, is very funny, and I was always the funniest kid in my class. And, you know, it's, you see early on, you see the kid who's the most athletic and you see the kid, but you know, who's the funniest. And so uh, being the funniest one, I really gravitated towards comedy. And I knew when I was about six that I wanted to do stand up and I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live and I wanted to do all that stuff. So... Um, what I started to do was as a kid, as I did as much theater as I could. I, and the idea was, um, I just thought it would be good idea to be comfortable on stage to once I started to do stand up. And of course, this being the eighties, the other idea was, I, you know, you become a stand up, they give you your own sitcom and I don't want to be one of these comics who was awkward and uncomfortable acting on his own sitcom. So I better learn how to act and to do all that. Kind of stuff. So, <laughs> how cool. Yeah. Little did I know that at the exact time I would start stand up in the late nineties is the exact time like survivor would start and you know, <laughs> TV would take over and sitcoms would die. But I really was uh, heads and tails above my contemporaries at the very beginning at the open mic stages and stuff, because even though my material wasn't there, I was super confident and I was super poised. And that was all from all the years of high school and grade school and community college and community theater and summer stock and all the theater I did. And then I started doing stand up when I was about 19. And I, uh, I lived, you know, the nearest club to where I lived was in Albany. So I would go out there and do guest spots and do these five minutes at the beginning of the late show once or twice a week. And I got to meet a lot of really, uh, you know, really great comics, and, and some of them were instrumental in, you know, helping me make the move to New York City when I was about 21 years old, and I've just been at it ever since. Oh, wow. Is there any comedians in particular that you can point to as far as, like, that inspired you to kind of, to go that way? Uh, well, I mean, I was a, there were so many that I was a fan of as a kid that inspired me to want to do it, but the ones who inspired me to actually make the move to New York City, the the biggest, the biggest one was Lisa Lampanelli. Oh and, wow! Uh, yeah, and this is this is 1999, 2000. So this is before she was, uh, you know, before she hit and before she really broke through. But she was so such a strong comic and such a force back then that uh, they the club where I was playing, they they had her up to headline. It seems once every five or six weeks. So. You know, she she took a liking to me because they they had a habit at that club of putting a lot of uh, uh, young comics on to do these guest spots. And and again, you know, just for the fact that I was more comfortable, I stood above them a little bit and stood out. And so 
she would say, I, you know, I, I don't want all these guest spots and you can only, if you're, if you're going to put guest spots, you can only put me up. And then she started, you know, she would stay, I would stay after her and she would help me with my jokes. And then, uh, she helped bring me down to New York and got me set up at, at, a stand up New York and helped me get a job there as a, as a, uh, you know, not even a job, basically an internship, but working the front desk and tearing tickets and delivering French fries and all that in exchange for a, a, a spot or two and, and maybe a cheeseburger and, you know, <laughs> and cab fare. Um, but that became like my college. I spent two years at Stand Up New York working the door and, and, and every night getting to watch these same comics again and again. You know, they were this is you know back at the beginning of this century so they were they were i was watching every night um jim gaffigan and todd barry and you know dave attell and jim norton and and greg giraldo and you know these really great strong comics and i was watching yeah, that's quite a lineup <laughs> yeah those are just off the top of my head bill burr and all these guys oh, wow. you know, and, I, and i was watching them night in and night out and i was what i was learning was how what the process is of how you take a germ of an idea and you bring it to the stage and you you start working on it and you fleshing it out night after night and I would watch a guy's bit grow and I would watch it get long and fat and then I would watch him trim the fat away and I and I watched how he just created what was the final piece you know that whole process in and out and then also people would drop in like you know, Jerry Seinfeld would drop in and Robin Williams would drop in. So I was getting to see these huge stars and watch them pop in Chris Rock and, you know, all that great stuff. How awesome. Um, yeah, it's a really, that's the that's the one advice I always give to young comics is if you're moving to New York City, try to get a job working the door at a club so that you can watch the pros and, and learn how they do it. it. There's really no school for it. You just have to absorb that stuff. With, with writing, you know, a lot of, you know, editors say, you know, read slush piles because that way you'll you'll really learn, you, you'll be able to spot, you know, common mistakes and then avoid them in your own writing. So. What is a slush pile? Is that like unsolicited stuff that just gets thrown into a pile? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like uh, literary magazines and, um, you know, agencies, um, publishers that accept unsolicited manuscripts. Um, I gotcha. Piles of, uh, piles of manuscripts. <laughs> You know, I'm not I'm not a, com- a comedian or an actor, but like like I've mentioned, I'm a writer, and both kind of those fields um, strike me as similar in the way that you kind of have to carve out a, work pretty hard to carve out a spot for yourself. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you have uh, I mean you have to be able to stand out from from a crowd and and stand out as your own voice and find a way of reaching your public, which I guess is easier now that we have social media and stuff you know but you really yeah it's a it's a big challenge of, of breaking through because in you know with stand-up stand-up comedy is one of those things that not everybody thinks that they can do it but way too many people think that they can do it and <laughs> you can do it you can go on one time you know do a guest spot at a club one time and call yourself a comedian you know, there, you can't, which is which is kind of ridiculous that you can do it once and have the same job title <laughs> that Jerry Seinfeld has. There, there's really no other field where you can really have, have that. Um, and then you go out and, you know, you perform in New York City on the night and, you know, there may be 15 comics on the lineup and there's, uh, you know, a thousand plus of us in this city. And then you, you go to some club, uh, you know, 200 miles away and you walk into that club and that club's walls are lined with photos of people I've never crossed paths with. You know, every market has their own huge group of people who are doing this. So there are so many people who do it and so many who are mediocre and you have to find a way of getting your voice heard through that din and and standing above them. And then once you're standing above them, now you're in the mix with a thousand other super talented people and how do you stand out from that crowd too you know yeah so i i think it's i think it's definitely you know i think there's definitely uh like writing you know you have to find your your audience and and let your voice be heard yeah um me personally like pretty much anytime i get ready to you know submit whether it's for my you know my articles or a book a short story or you know even you know this the the podcast 
I always have like some level of nerves that I have to overcome and little things that I do to do that. Do you get nervous beforehand? No, I don't. Um, that comes with experience and that comes with Just, confidence. Yeah. And I, and again, I think a big part of that goes back to all the, you know, the theater training. And then it's been, you know, 15 years I've been doing stand up. So. Fair enough. You, you have quite a bit under your belt at this point. So it's, yeah, you know, and, you, and, 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 and if you're doing it right, then you build a tool belt and you, yeah. you have the tools to handle whatever situation, whatever a heckler or uh, a broken glass that's, you know, glass breaking that steals focus or, or anything else. Um, and you should be able to, if you're a good comic um, or a journeyman, you know, you should be able to go into a comedy club and then go down the road and perform at a bookstore and then that weekend perform at a Kiwanis club. You know, you should be able to do it all and, and do it confidently. And so if you have those chops and you have that confidence, um, you, there are no, there's no real nerves. It, it becomes interesting. You know, yeah, it's kind of like saying, "Oh, I'm nervous to fly," but the pilot's not. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a good analogy. Yeah. I like that analogy. Yeah. So shortly before uh, we talked, I was, you know, just doing some tapping around, and I was on your site watching your videos. And the first video, I believe, that's on there, you were. Uh, telling a joke about how you got your nephews and nieces all these presents um, oh, yeah. and they gave you a cold and that just made me just laugh because I mean I have two kids and I'm currently getting over some nasty bug that they gave me and they're always giving me bugs so that was, <laughs> it was funny <laughs> yeah I become quite a germaphobe the older I get and uh, and that that that's some of the funniest stuff. You know, what makes it funny is that it comes from truth and you don't realize, you know, you don't realize that, but that idea came, you know, the premise, the basic premise of the joke is that it, it, how ripped off an uncle is at Christmas time because I have to, you know, we flew out, my wife is from Nebraska. So we flew out to Nebraska and, you know, we spent all this money on our tickets and then we bought the kids all this stuff. And of course, you know, little kids, they're not required to give you a gift. Yeah. <laughs> What they do give you is they give you a a, a, a virus of some sort because <laughs> kids are filthy and they don't understand germs. And that is, you know, the, the holiday season ends and the cold and flu season begins. Well, why? Because you're around. Look, look we went to, um, I remember that same trip. We went to like an Olin Mills like a family, uh, family photography center, you know, and while we're waiting to have uh, for our turn to have our picture taken i'm watching my nieces and nephews just dive into this big community pile of toys <laughs> you just think of all the other kids who are dripping snot who have been playing with those same toys and putting them in their mouth and it's of course it's a natural that that they just they just pick up every every disease every germ every cold and flu cell that's out there they're going to pick it up and then they're naturally going to give it to you somehow. So yeah, that, yeah the truth in it. <laughs> no, it's it, oh, definitely. Well, and just like you know, we uh, we live in Seattle, and one time I was we went as a family down to the waterfront, the waterfront, and my son was just rubbing his mouth all over the railing in a parking garage, and it's like, man, you're going to kill all of us. <laughs> <laughs> they have no concept of what's gross. They just don't get it. Which is actually kind of beautiful, you know, to not ha you know to not have that concept yet. Yeah, I suppose <laughs> that's what they need us for. Yeah, <laughs> yep. So, and then you you currently um, open up for the nightly show and the late show, right? Uh, yeah, the nightly show with Larry Wilmore is my steady job, and then as far as the late show with Stephen Colbert, I do that. As I'm one, I'm the substitute for their warm-up guy. So if he can't be there, they call me. So that's not a that's an every once in a while job. Okay. And then like, so how long would you say that you've been you've been doing that particular gig? I really started doing audience warm-up in earnest about I'd say about five years ago. It was uh, yeah, it was about five years ago that I got hired by the Daily Show, and I had done. I, I mean, uh, going back to 2008 is when I actually first did any real audience warm up. And I, um, but you know, you, that was just getting my foot in the industry a little bit. And it took a while to get anything solid, but I was hired by the daily show 
uh, in 2000, I think 2011, 2010 or 2011. And then since then, uh, I've, I've, you know, we have worked within that production company, John Stewart's production company, and have moved on to do The Daily Show and then Colbert Report and now The Nightly Show and The Late Show. Is Those those shows are all produced by the same company. So I'm I don't think that. I realize that. Yeah, yeah. John Stewart's one of the producers of The Late Show as well. Yeah, and I definitely didn't know that. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, 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 that's kind of a cool little, little uh, accomplishment that, that I, I have that I can, uh, if I ever have grandkids, can tell them about one day, which is, you know, I'm the only person in the world who Jon Stewart has hired, at least in a comedic p- capacity, for every one of his shows since The Daily Show. Oh, that is cool. Yeah, right? Yeah, that's definitely. Fun. And then because I've done those, then other jobs pop up. I get to do other shows. You get, it's a small community. You know, there's a lot of TV that's done in New York, but there's only, there's only a handful of us who do warm up, uh, audience warm up. It's kind of a tough racket to get into, but once you're in. Oh, is it? Yeah. Well, they don't really, because they don't, the producers of the shows don't go to, you know, they're not going to go to the comic strip on a Wednesday night scouting for somebody to do audience warm up. They're just going to call somebody they know at another show and say, who can you recommend? You know, so it takes a while to break in, but once you're in and if you do it well, uh, then the phone rings and other, you know, even if it's just for a day to fill in somewhere, there's, you know, usually rarely does a month go by where I don't pick up some other random show. That's really cool. It sounds really yeah. like a really interesting gig. It can be. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, you get to, you know, if you're into celebrity and stuff like that, you certainly get to meet a lot of people. Um, and if you're, and if you're a fan of the show, as I was with the daily show long before I worked for it, then it's like, you know, it's, it's like you're getting, you're getting a call to, to pitch for your favorite ball team or whatever, you know, yeah. that's amazing. You know, you know, cause you, I would have gone and actually I did before I worked there to tapings of the daily show just to watch it just to see john stewart live and then to be you know to be picked from from that group to actually get to perform on the stage and get to bring him out and you know all that that's that's amazing you know that's that was a dream come true that's awesome that's yeah. it, it's cool to be a dream dream come trues those, those are cool to achieve well yeah i mean like, like like i said earlier when i was six i wanted to be a stand-up comic and i wanted to work for the uh for saturday night live and you know um looking looking now i i I got that i'm a working stand-up comic i'm not working for saturday night live but i'd like to think that 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 uh if the daily show was around when i was six or seven that's what i would have aspired to and i'm a better fit for that than snl so i'm i got to work for you know that and colbert for like two of the coolest shows in tv history yeah It's, it's definitely it's definitely a very cool thing um, and so you mentioned earlier that you're you're a part of a new writing project. Can you talk about that at all yet, or yeah, just yet? Okay. But um, but I will certainly let you know down the road because it's actually uh, Seattle is a big part of it, and I'm going to be coming out to Seattle with with the project and and, and everything else. But it's uh, working with another comedian from Seattle on uh, on his one man show. Is basically all I can say about it right now. Okay, very cool. And yes, definitely keep me posted. Yeah. Um, and I didn't ask this before, but what part did you play in Midsummer Night's Dream? I played Theseus in ah, Midsummer Night's Dream. How cool! Yeah, yeah, it was it was okay. It's just a bit of a smaller role. Um, he kind of set the plot in motion, and then. But he's a pretty yeah. I was going to say he's a pretty important character, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he is. He, he sets a plot in motion, then he disappears for an hour, and then he, and then he comes back at the end. It, uh, it was a, you know, it wasn't, uh, to tell you, you know, in all honesty, it was, it was uh, of the three shows I did, it was my least favorite role, because I did, before that I did Twelfth Night, and I was Sir Toby Belch, and that was a awesome. blast. And before that, we did uh, Much Ado About Nothing, and I got to play Dogberry. And, uh, oh, how cool. Yeah, and we set those plays, um, this theater company, when they do Shakespeare, they set it in modern times and they update it. And uh, so with Much Ado and playing Dogberry, you know, he's the, the inept captain of the watch, of the guards. So my we, we dressed me up. My costume was, uh, it was a total uh, take on Curtis Sliwa and the, um, the guardian angels. So I had the red jacket and a red and a beret on and it was just a, 
just a total douchebag. So I got to really tear into him. And that was that was my most fun. I really loved doing that. That sounds fun. Yeah, yeah. They're all fun. Theseus was fun too. We played him as a uh, uh, since it was set in modern times and on New York's Lower East Side. We set him as a as a gangster, so we put me in you know, a bit of a of a heavy. So we put me in a fat suit, and I had a little pencil thin mustache and a and a suit. And you know, he was because his job is to is, is basically to tell Hermia that you know if she doesn't marry Demetrius as her father wants, then she's going to be killed. So who the only person who can kill you in modern day with authority would be a mobster. So that's how we went with that one. Oh, cool! I really like the idea of the the modern times element to it. You're you're yeah. you're able to tweak some things and make it pretty interesting. I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, it makes it. I think you know one could argue that it makes it more um, more accessible to to people a little bit as opposed to everybody performing in togas and robes and whatever else. You know, it's uh, it, it's a different take on it. It's not the traditional take, but it it served its purpose and the shows were successful. So that we get to do more of them. I personally, I think it's really important to you know, take classics and, and stuff, you know, because today with media, I mean, there's like three minute, you know, funny cat videos on YouTube that everybody's watching and all this stuff. And I do that too. I mean, I do it. But I mean, as far as like, you know, media has changed so much with technology and people have consumed things in all different ways. So, you know, I know with my kids, I try to like just get them to watch like Charlie Brown's Christmas and, you yeah. know, the animation is like completely like not up to their standards. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, 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 uh, you know, good, good luck getting a, getting a, a millennial to watch a Marx brothers, you know, to something in black and white. It's not going to happen. It's very, it's really sad how, what, what the downside of all this technology is and, and how, you know, how people can get so comfortable in their own little circles and their own, what, whatever it is you're into, there is an unlimited supply of it online, and so you don't end up really necessarily exploring, you know, what whatever else. Like, I always, for, for me, like, when it came to, like, say, music or something, it was always, well, I got into, say, the Rolling Stones, um, but then you would, you would listen to them, and then you would read about them, and then, oh, they're talking about Chuck Berry, and they're talking about Howling Wolf and, and Muddy Waters, and so you start going back into who influenced them, and same thing with comedy. If you listen to you like my comedy, and then you hear me talking about George Carlin or, or or people like that, then hopefully a fan of mine would go back and start discovering George Carlin and start yeah. discovering people who aren't in their newsfeed. But but you know, sadly, more more often than not, it seems people aren't that interested in doing that, even though it's so accessible to them. You know, it, it's uh, so true. Well, with all the you know the categories and the tags and you mm -hmm. know people's feeds it's like you know a lot of times you, you people are just like completely in their own echo chamber yeah it's and it's it's crazy you know it's it's a uh, we we actually did one night um after the play at one of our rap parties we we i play a game sometimes and i've done it on stage too and it's it's a sad game it's very sad but i talk to a millennial we'll talk to somebody who's like 25 years old, you know, and I will ask them what, what we would consider extremely basic trivia at, about recent history that the millennials have a, um, they have a real dark, dark space in, 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 as far as their knowledge that kind of ends with, you know, maybe goes up to, uh, the day Kennedy was killed, and then from that on till today, there's just this big gray area. So I'll ask basic questions. Like my favorite one, what got me started on it was once um, being on an airplane with uh, someone who was like 24 years old and talking about Bo Jackson. And that person had no idea who Bo Jackson was, which, which is, is crazy to me that, you know, that in – only 20 years, the biggest sports celebrity, one of the biggest celebrities for a solid five-year period is just a shadow. They have no idea who that person is. Whereas me, not being a millennial, I was born in 1979, but I still know who Reggie Jackson was. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's crazy. So we just spent oh, we spent hours, which I'm sure was, was uber insulting to this person, but just asking these couple of millennials these questions about, you know, basic 
basic history, you know, and uh, and and them just coming up short again and again and again. It, it was quite depressing. <laughs> well, so it's interesting. So. I believe I fall somewhere in the middle there. I mean, so I'm I'm 29. I was born in 87. Um, but my I had an older brother who was 10 years older than me. Um, mm-hmm. And personality wise, I'm very a uh, very analog. I watched all I, as far as Mark's brothers. You know, I watched that with my dad. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm not quite, but I, I wouldn't say that I'm completely out of the clear either yet with, you know, yeah. some of that millennial stuff. But you know what? And to be, I mean, it isn't just to be fair, but also like there's a lot of what's popular now and popular to millennials that is completely foreign to me as well. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not in on, on what they're into these days. Um, but I don't know. Let, let's me sound like a, 300 year old man oh no 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 i I, don't i find it super interesting and because you know and as far as like the kid and the family thing you know i all start i started that really young so as far Mm -hmm. as like the combination between you know being super aware of you know the you know 90s culture and all that as a kid um and kind of you know i'm still you know i'm in that age group as far as like you know the typical age of a parent that has children my age you know you know are are there so but at the same time yeah so i'm i consider myself on the fence <laughs> yeah yeah i think you are pretty much right on the fence that's right uh but i mean even you know a couple of weeks ago i was having a conversation with somebody who is not that much younger than me but with just the difference of you know our our lifestyles and what we were around as a kid it it felt like there was 10 years there so it is it kind of funny yeah, it is. It's 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 really surreal. It's really strange. I don't see. I don't think that someone who was born in 1969 would have such a generational gap with someone who was born in 1979. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, somebody was born in 19, you know, 79 versus somebody who was born in 1989 or 1995. It is a huge difference in in just perspective and everything else and that's a big thing to do with with the internet definitely what my kids were able to do by the time they were four on you know the computer and on the ipad is just crazy and the fact like i'm always telling my kids like because i still i had saturday morning cartoons Uh they have you know netflix so they can just not only do they have they can have saturday morning cartoons anytime they want but they can you know watch stuff from like all over the place it's it's crazy oh my god well even even more more of that i mean just if if you look at when i was you know 14 years old the amount of work that it put in that it took me just to see a playboy centerfold you know you would have we would have guys would have one stolen from their father and everybody would come from blocks around to see it and then it would be hidden under a branch behind the little league field you know and and we would literally go behind a truck stop into their dumpster to get used porn (laughs) we had to do a lot of work just to see a booby now it's one click away like it's amazing uh, what is out there and what's available and not that that's a good thing either but but you know what 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 a change this internet has been it's it's amazing it really is well and it you know and it goes you know back to kind of what we're talking with like the you know the whole echo chamber there's also like this instant gratification that like is like you know with you know all these free apps in the app store or you know all the books and the videos and all these things that you can just instantly get and, yeah. um, you know, and I find myself as a parent trying to police that to be like, OK, just because the kids can click this one thing and instantly get a video game. How about they don't? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the instant gratification, though, can be good. Like for what I do, you, you know, and, and, like say I could take a bit or an idea or a joke. And if I can get that out as a tweet and, you know, if I tweet something out and it gets a lot of likes and a lot of retweets. Well, I know that that's going to work in the room when I do it, if I do it in a stand-up stage. So that's a nice, a nice part of it that I can test the waters a little bit. And like, I'll, I'll tweet something out. And if I don't have a like or a retweet or something like inside of mm, 60 to 90 seconds, I'll delete the damn thing. You know, I'll be like, okay, well that was a miss and, and go on about my day. 
So there's a there's good and bad to the whole thing. Oh, definitely. Well, and I, you know, I use I use Twitter similarly for that too, with random ideas or, you know, different ways to, you know, engage my readers, my listeners. And like with my blog, you know, I can spend 30 minutes and put out like a little fictional piece or, you know, what's on my mind. And, you know, sometimes like my uh, other podcast, which is a fictional serial, that started because I was posting just these little segments of dialogue and ideas on my blog. And I was getting a lot of interest. I was like, huh, I'm having fun writing it. And, you know, it's getting, you know, it's getting good traction. Let's, you know, make something of it. No, as a, the, what technology has done for writing careers in the last 10 years, it's incredible. It's completely yeah. changed it. Oh yeah. It's, it's great. And it's great for, you know, for, for comedy and for comics, like, you know, like, like, a like the idea of a podcast or things like that, like being able definitely to, being able to do something like I have my own podcast and being able to do that on a Monday night. And to, to sit at a table with some of my friends and to, to, to just enjoy each other's company and have a great time, have it recorded and then put out to the world. And then, you know, we get over, you know, about a, a, on average, about 100,000 downloads a month. That is a lot of people listening in. That's yeah. a lot of reach that I have that I did not need to you know, be, you know, I didn't need to, to pitch it and be signed off by somebody at Comedy Central. I didn't need, uh, I didn't need, you know, agents or managers or anything else to set this deal up and get it all running. It's, it's me, a couple of friends, a microphone, and we do it, we send it out. And a lot of people hear it. And a lot of people hear when I'm performing somewhere and it helps sell tickets and it helps um, for whatever the next step is. If I want to write a book or if I want to do something else, I have built this nice audience who will ideally buy my book or my new album. That's amazing. It That's really so, is. such a great thing. Oh, it's, yeah. No, it is awesome. Well, and then yeah. podcasting in general, I mean, it is such an, it's just, I mean, I love listening to them. And the, uh-huh. ever since I started uh, Too Many Words, I uh, and it's something that I wanted to do for a while. And once I started doing it, started getting listeners and I was like, oh, wow. And I didn't even realize how much I was going to love it until I was already doing it. And so yeah. much of that is just, it's, you know, like you said, the positive side of, of it is how much more is accessible for, you know, all sorts right. of people. Um, so it's. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you have a blog, you have a podcast, you have whatever as just as a writer, you're not sending you know, those unsolicited manuscripts that just end up in a pile and waiting for, you know, waiting for some editor or some editor's assistant to happen by your stuff and find it. It's like you, you can go out, find your own audience and build that audience mm-hmm. and have people, your stuff like that's, that's wonderful. That's yeah. Wonderful. You may not become a millionaire by it, but if your goal is to reach an audience and to entertain them, you can do that very effectively. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, Kevin, can you tell everybody where they can uh, where they can find you on Twitter and your site and all that? Yeah, everything is uh, the one stop shop is kevinbartini dot com, and that you can find links to my Twitter and my Facebook and the YouTube and the podcast and and everything else. Uh, it's really easy for you, kevinbartini dot com. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was great talking to you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Well, and that wraps it up for now, folks. Thanks so much for listening, and uh, go visit the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. Let me know what you think with a review. Come uh, follow me on Twitter at MeBettingField. Follow the show at Twitter for updates and other fun tidbits at Too Many Words Pod. Come to my site. Find all that you need at JamieBettingField.com. Until next time. Thanks for listening.